I've got to tell you, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Well, it seems our railway system is far from getting back on track. A recent Operation Vulintela report has found inefficiencies in the ports and rail system severely affected the ability to export goods. The report on the work of Operation Vulintela for the first quarter of 2022 was released today. Cabinet has also adopted a white paper on the national rail policy in March to reform the sector. Let's discuss all of these developments. I'm joined now by Dr. Kenneth Kramer, who is senior lecturer at the VETS School of Economic and Business Sciences. Good evening, Dr. Kramer. I appreciate your time. So the last iteration of the white paper on the national rail policy that had come out in 2017 described a, a, a grand vision of rail forming the backbone of land transportation by 2050, uh, sparking a rail renaissance. And today we had uh, the one that has now been approved by cabinet, the white paper, uh, that has now been gazetted. <laughs> How far are we uh, in terms of the trajectory with the gazetting of this white paper between gazetting and that grand vision of 2050? Does this move us any closer to that, that, that grand vision that is spelled out in the 2017 white paper? Actually, Cesare, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, you're quite right. Uh, the reform of our rail system is part of uh, the Operation Wulindlela program, um, which is a, a joint initiative of the, the presidency and the national treasury. And I think just to think about the, the context and the background, after years of state capture of eye off the ball, um, Vulindlela is attempting to refocus the state and strengthen capability regarding certain key structural uh, reforms that are required, things that are limiting the ability of our economy to grow, things that are limiting the ability of the economy to create jobs. So rail is, is one of those, and we'll talk about that in some detail. And there's other focus areas of Vulindlela as well, which came out in today's report around electricity, visas um, and, and water and a range of other areas, the, the spectrum as well. But on the rail side of things, as you say, the, the state of South African rail is really uh, of great concern and is becoming a, a constraint on the economy. Um, there's two levels to it that I can talk about. The one would be the freight rail, yeah. the, um, the movement of goods, whether it's agricultural goods or mining goods uh, from South Africa's farms and from our mines into the export markets and around the country. And the second is the commuter rail. Yeah. I think the major intervention we're seeing now is under the Bulindlela rubric is to try and bring focus to reforming that uh, sorry state of affairs um, with regard to the, the, uh, the freight rail in particular, opening it up to new companies to begin to operate on that rail to improve efficiencies and competition. As long as it's well designed and those new companies have an incentive to invest it's expensive rail stock. They know that there's security on those lines. They know that the rail lines themselves are properly maintained. There's electricity. I think it could really assist to improve our output. And on the commuter side, it looks like the, there's an intention to devolve things down to a more municipal level, the large cities being able to take more control. Like in many parts of the world, there's, there's more kind of city orientation regard to commuter rail rather than a national system. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be uh, the, the, on the rail side, uh, to the seas way. Sure. Talk to me for a moment, Dr. Krima, about the freight rail uh, part of things. The grand idea is to move as much freight as possible um, from the roads onto, um, you know, trains, uh, because, you know, it's better for haulage, etc. Uh, you mentioned the recent opening up of some of the corridors uh, to private players, but... Other than that, is there anything that's tangible in terms of the reforms? As you say, you're saying it's starting to be a constraint uh, in as far as the economy is concerned. Yes, well, one of our major lines is the uh, Richards Bay coal line that takes coal out of the country through Richards Bay, a very impressive terminal. And uh, year after year, it would be exporting an extra 10 million tons, an extra 10 million tons, and we'd see the, the numbers growing year after year. But in, in recent times, unfortunately, the metric has been moving in the wrong direction. 
and uh, there's been a decrease in the uh, in the productivity of that line. And it's a, it's a major concern, particularly regarding disruption, um, whether it's because of criminal elements who are stealing copper off the off the lines, um, is one of the major things, and also just rail efficiency, the, the the rolling stock itself being efficient and operational. So the idea would be, I think we still, as a, the operation, Bulindlela, um, is trying to bring government departments together in the rail sector. If we look at how they've done it in the electricity sector, you bring the various stakeholders together and you say, well, we have a binding constraint here. We do not have enough electricity. What reforms are required? And if you look at the analogy, the reform that was identified there was to allow private companies to begin up to 100 megawatts to invest in their own mm. uh, electricity projects without having to go through the rigmarole of a license. But as you hint, this is it's a process, it's not an event. You know, as you begin to do reforms, it reveals other weaknesses in the system. So in the, in the electricity side, there's new red tape, there's uh, uh, the, the actual grid itself requires investment. But from where I'm sitting, it's we are beginning to see government trying to do the right things, not only stating its objectives and its intentions, but the how part of it. The how part of it is what is being articulated. How do we do this? Um, yeah. And it is a, a, a movement in the right direction, but it's going to take some time to see the fruits of this. Uh, to listen yeah. to Let's turn then our attention to commuter rail, because, you know, it really is a sad state of, state of affairs um, that this is one mode that, is meant to be affordable and convenient, uh, you know, for uh, you know working class um, commuters. But you know, even from the figures that Prasa itself puts out, it is quite clear that this, this sector has been on the decline. Um, from their report, 2019-2020, they said that they ran on 110 actual trains, and you compare that with 288 at one point, and this was 2013, 2014. I know that a lot has been happening, for instance, the opening of the Kibela factory uh, to try and uh, ensure that there's rolling stock, but there are issues as well of maintenance and refurbishment, even of those, uh, those coaches that are available. So just your sense then of we can focus on the state of the infrastructure in as far as the overhead cables, uh, the rail lines and the vandalism of the stations and, and, and the likes. But do we actually have trains to run, uh, even if we were to get these other elements correct? Well, to this is where uh, the, on, the, on the commuter side of things, I think the key messaging that we're getting out of the reforms is that there needs to be a decentralization, or I think the term that is used in the, in the documents and the white paper, and that is a, a devolution of responsibility. It's almost like we're going to have to build again from the ground up. The kind of numbers you're seeing of people using commuter rail in South Africa today, compared to the types of numbers uh, a few years back, it's an order of magnitude smaller. You know, it's like f from a, a, a couple of million down to hundreds of thousands of rides being taken in an in a, in a annual period. So it's really a, a much reduced usage of the rail system. And I think until it becomes reliable again and people believe that they can travel safely and reliably and the trains will not uh, be late and be falling behind and they can get to work on time, it's going to be quite a major effort to rebuild the, the commuter rail system. And the strategy that is, is followed in this country and in this new strategy as it is in other places would be to devolve that into um, Cape Town, into Johannesburg, where cities begin to take greater responsibility for the running of their own commuter rail systems. Mm. Yeah, just to put perspective to those numbers, also coming out from the PRASA um, you know, annual report for 2019-2020, the figures they cite there, just to back up your point, Dr. Krima, they're saying that they ran 125.24 million metro rail passenger trips in 2019-2020, 125 million, and you compare that with 543 million passenger trips in 2013 and 2014, and you get the picture of where we are. Um, so lastly then, uh, Dr. Krima, th th there are a number of other developments that, at least from the 2017 white paper, uh, were being proposed, uh, such as, you know, issues to do with introduction of higher speed trains and 
and that has to do with some technicalities of how wide or how narrow uh, the gate is and that also has implications for freight trains as well in terms of stacking um, of, of, of containers. How far are we from the vision that uh, President Ramaphosa invited us all to uh, in 2019 and said, you know, I picture high-speed trains um, going from Cape Town to Mosina, etc. Within what has happened today with the white paper being uh, uh, gazetted, how far are we realistically from even dreaming about high-speed trains? Yeah, you, you're reminding me of the, the day the presidents took a ride on the trains uh, near north of Pretoria. I think we and might it was be going seeing nowhere slowly. A, <laughs> yeah, high, taking another high-speed train, let's hope. But uh, I think what you, an interesting point that you're pointing to here is this technological change that is taking place in all the sectors. You know, Volendela is opening up a number of sectors, electricity, rail, telecommunications, and we have to be forward-looking in every one of those sectors because the actual technology that is available changes. So you can't say, oh, it must be the same as it was before. In the electricity sector, the, the, the cheaper sources are, are wind and solar that never existed previously. When it comes to um, 5G, that's a new technology, cellular technology. On the rail side, you're quite right. The, the technology is changing with regard to the, the speed, the size, the, 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 um, the, the scope and the, the length of trains, etc., which the, 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 the legislation and the regulations have to all be changed in line with those technological improvements because they were written for a previous era and previous technological um, uh, availability. So the lesson in government and governance is that you constantly have to move with the times. You have to look at what is available, how best can it be applied, and only then can you provide a, sustain, a sustainable service, you know, because things, yeah. things uh, the one constant in this process is there is change. And it does make the role of government even more difficult because it is never fully settled. It's an ongoing process of trying to improve service delivery. Yeah. Dr. Krima, I've got to thank you for your time. I must tell you, um, I've not been able to see the latest version of the white paper that was meant to have been gazetted today. And I guess it's just a lag uh, between the submission for gazetting and actually being published on the government gazette. But I must tell you, the 2017 one had me excited. It, it, it had me thinking that actually what a brilliant set of ideas uh, that if only we could get implementation, right? That, that typical South African African situation where uh, we are not short of good ideas, but implementing them, quite another story. Dr. Kenneth Krima there uh, joining me and having a conversation about uh, Operation Vulindlela and its implications in as far as the rail sector is concerned, as well as the gazetting of the white paper on the national rail policy.